Hey everyone and welcome. My name is Stephanie Will. I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor and I'm the mental health services program manager here at Montgomery College and I work with our Student Health and Wellness Center for Success or Shaw Center. Now you might be familiar with Shaw. Um, we do a number of different types of programming. We have like our Fuel for Success program, which does things like the mobile market. Uh, we have our uh, health safety educational programming, which has trainings like bringing in the bystander and sexual assault awareness month. We also have our physical health wellness piece that does um, fun classes like yoga and Zumba, belly dancing. We also do our flu shot clinics. Plus we also have our a uh, new SRP program that helps connect students to resources in the community and teaches them how to navigate those systems. Now I am in charge of our mental health program and we do all sorts of interesting trainings, trying to educate people about mental health, um, such as the one that you are watching today. Um, we also do our mental health first aid certification training and things like Mindful Monday and other stress relieving programming. So I do welcome you here to our What is Counseling uh, information session today. So to start off, we're actually gonna talk a little bit about two of the most common um, mental health disorders that we see on college campuses, anxiety and depression. Then we're going to talk a little bit about what counseling actually is. We found that Many, many people, you know, we talk about counseling, we talk about therapy, um, you know, you should go see a therapist, you should go talk to a counselor, but we never really talk about what to expect. So that's what we're going to be spending some time with today, really what to know before you go to talk to a counselor um, or a therapist, and um, what are some of the things that you should prepare for when you're um, going into that first and future session. And then finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, I think I'm struggling with my mental health. What do I do now? So to start off, um, I just like to define a mental health disorder so we are all on the same page. Uh, mental health disorder is something that impacts a person's thoughts, feelings, and behavior. So it really does have an all-encompassing impact on a person. Um, and it interferes with an individual's daily life. So being able to get up, go to work, go to school, complete assignments, take care of themselves, take care of family members. Um, it's really that interference in daily life that's one of the things that we really look for when we're actually diagnosing a mental health disorder. Because the reality of the situation is we all experience a wide range of emotions at a given point in our life, right? If a relationship ends, we're probably gonna be pretty sad about it. Um, if we have a new job, we might be really excited about the new job. Um, just because we might be feeling really good doesn't necessarily mean we have something like bipolar disorder. And just because we might be feeling sad about something that's going on um, in our life doesn't necessarily mean we have something like depression. So we really, have to be careful about over pathologizing. Anxiety tends to be one of the current buzzwords where you know a lot of people are talking about, oh, I have anxiety, I have anxiety. Well, everybody experiences anxiety at some point in their life, right? The anxiety is an emotion, um, the anticipation of an event, and we will all experience anxiety. It doesn't necessarily mean that a person has an anxiety disorder. So we'll talk a little bit about what uh, depressive disorder and anxiety disorder actually might look like. Um, it doesn't mean that if we're feeling anxious about something that there's not coping skills we can put into play. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't see a therapist if you'd like to see a therapist, but we just have to be careful about labeling people um, and with disorders that might not have them. Um, just because if you don't have diabetes, you don't want um, to be labeled as having diabetes, it, it does no good, right? Um, and it doesn't give you the correct information that you need um, to be dealing with whatever might be going on with you physically and mentally. Uh, you also have to think when we talk about mental health disorders, uh, we have to think about what is developmentally appropriate at certain ages as well. Um, we all know teenagers are just much more emotional than adults are. That's 
just how their brains are working at that moment. So a teenager feeling depressed about something is relatively typical. But again, we want to look at what goes beyond um, that developmental appropriate behavior um, that might be then impacting their daily life and their ability to do what they need to do over the course of their day. So first, we're going to talk a little bit of, about anxiety. So anxiety disorders basically display excessive fear and anxiety related to a behavioral disturbance. Um, fear is the emotional response to a real or perceived imminent threat. So fear would be, there's a snake in front of me and I am afraid of the snake, right? And anxiety is the anticipation of a future threat. So uh, we might be feeling anxious about a test that I have tomorrow. Um, so that's the difference between those two. There are a number of different types of anxiety disorders that a person might have. Uh, generalized anxiety disorder, there are specific phobias, which is things like a person who might be afraid of snakes or flying or spiders or uh, clowns, you know, whatever the case may be. It's something specific that triggers that fear response. Um, there's also social anxiety disorder, and panic disorder. Um, so there's a number of different uh, types of anxiety disorders um, that a person could be diagnosed with. Generally, there are some common signs and symptoms that a person might be displaying. Physically, a person might be experiencing heart palpitations. So, um, you know, a heart beating very rapidly. A person might be experiencing tightness in their chest or chest pains. A person might be sweating uncomfortably. Um, might be experiencing trembling or shaking in hands, legs, um, feeling nauseous or having abdominal distress, um, or even dizzy or lightheaded. Um, so kind of the room might be spinning, person might need to sit down. Um, the emotional experience, um, signs and symptoms wise that a person might have are fear of losing control or going crazy or a fear of dying. Um, and these are especially true if somebody is experiencing a panic attack. Uh, and then cognitively, you know, as far as our thoughts go, um, there are a couple of signs and symptoms such as avoidance of fearful stimuli or situations. So if a person is afraid of flying, they won't get on a plane. Um, but in other types of disorders, like a social anxiety disorder, um, you know, this could be a lot more disruptive if a person uh, refuses to give a presentation in their class or um, refuses to go out and socialize in certain types of situations. Whereas, um, I guess if you have a job that requires you to fly frequently, um, that would be impacting daily life as well. But um, for many, for many specific phobias, avoidance of the 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 phobic object um, isn't out of the question, but for some people, it is something that they can't necessarily avoid. And the other thing uh, mentally that we have to think about is the fear response is often disproportional uh, to the actual threat. So I like to use the example of um, one time when I was in my parents' basement a number of years ago, there was a little like salamander or something um, on the floor. And I, I don't necessarily have a specific, specific phobia of salamanders, but I was just absolutely terrified. Like I screamed, I couldn't move, I couldn't walk past this thing. And my brother-in-law, of course, sat and laughed at me, which he's super nice to do, right? Um, but I recognize rationally that this is a salamander. It's not poisonous. It's not going to bite me. There's no way that this thing can hurt me in any way, shape or form, but I cannot physically move my body to walk past this little salamander. So that again, that fear response is disproportional to the actual threat that was facing me in that moment. So again, we're looking at those um, interference with daily life a person who's having panic attacks um, to the point where they aren't able to go to the grocery store, uh, a person who's freezing up and unable to take an exam because their entire brain just kind of goes blank when they sit in front of the computer. Um, 
again, not being able to go out into certain situations, um, whether it's avoiding things like flying or avoiding uh, different social situations. So hopefully that clears up a little bit about anxiety. And then we can talk a little bit about depression. So the broad, gener gen ugh, broad definition of depressive disorder is that they um, basically come with persistent sad, empty, or irritable mood and with phys physical and cognitive changes that significantly impact functioning. So we can't have a diagnosis of depression without feeling sad. I mean, that's, that's kind of the hallmark. Everything else um, is additional symptoms, but that um, sad mood is the number one symptom we see. So there are also a number of different depressive disorders, um, major depressive disorder, persistent depressive disorder, um, and premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And so some common signs and symptoms we might see under that depression umbrella, um, physically eating too much or too little, um, especially if it's a major change from how much the person usually would eat. Um, so we see both ends of the spectrum. It can be too much or not enough. Uh, we, again, on opposite ends of the spectrum, insomnia, where you're not getting any sleep or hypersomnia, you're sleeping too much. Um, and also low energy, fatigue, just feeling tired, not motivated. Emotionally, again, I mentioned a depressed mood, but we also see a lot of low self-esteem, feelings of worthlessness or inappropriate guilt, uh, which would be feeling guilty about things that you're not actually responsible for. So, um, and then hopelessness is another big one. Hopelessness is actually our number one red flag when we are talking about doing a suicide assessment. So if you're speaking with somebody or you yourself are feeling like there's no reason to try to change, things are never going to get any better, things are always going to be bad, um, that's something that we really need to be on the lookout for and making sure that we are connecting that person with some supportive services. Cognitively, their thought processes, a lot of individuals struggle with poor concentration or difficulty making decisions. Making a decision can feel like a really overwhelming task when one's dealing with depression. Uh, there's a loss of interest um, and a loss of pleasure in usual activities. So maybe hobbies or things that a person really used to enjoy, they just don't want to do or they just don't find enjoyable anymore. And again, going back to talking about what's developmentally appro appropriate, you know, in late adolescence and early adulthood, many people are kind of shedding the things they used to enjoy as children and are developing new adult um, things that they enjoy. So um, not playing with, you know, dolls anymore and shifting more towards, um, I don't know, playing, playing a sport, playing soccer. Um, that's not the same thing because we're seeing one interest being replaced by another. When we talk about loss of interest, it means that they would maybe drop playing with dolls or playing soccer or whatever it was, and they don't pick anything else back up. Um, and of course, if anybody is talking about having suicidal thoughts or um, makes a suicide attempt, that is 100% something we need to take seriously and make sure we're getting that person connected to help. Because that's another pretty severe uh, symptom that we can, can see in depression. So one of the things that, especially since COVID and the pandemic, I like to talk about is something called languishing. And this has been a really tough 15, 16 months that we've all been going through. And there has been a really increased instance of mental health disorders being diagnosed. A lot of people going um, and teaching, searching out counseling services for the first time. Um, and uh, increase in suicidal thoughts, increase in suicidal behaviors as well, especially among teenagers. So there's been a lot going on. Um, but something that really resonated with me when I, you know, first heard about it, this is something that's been around for forever. It just came to my consciousness recently is this languishing. 
And languishing is not a mental health disorder. This is not in our diagnostic and statistical manual. This is simply kind of a state of being. And it's really about the absence of mental wellness. You're not mentally ill. Again, wellness is kind of on a spectrum. One end is wellness, one end is illness, and you can kind of be anywhere in between. You know, languishing is kind of like that mid midpoint. You know, you're not necessarily well, you're not flourishing necessarily. There's a lot of feeling of monotony, emptiness, stagnation, apathy, just generally being unsettled. Um, and it can come with a lack of interest in things that you usually enjoy. Um, sometimes, you know, it can feel a little bit like burnout, feeling like you have nothing left to give. Um, and for, I think this is something that a number of people experience during the pandemic, where they're not necessarily dealing with a diagnosable mental health disorder, but they don't feel well, they don't feel like themselves. Um, and they're definitely having some impact on that mental wellness spectrum. And for a lot of people, it ends up feeling kind of like laziness, like, oh, like I'm just not motivated. I'm feeling really lazy today. But the thing is, that's not what it is. It's not laziness. It's not a failing of anyone, um, you know, of their personality or of their strength of character or anything. Um, you know, languishing is something that I think has been very prevalent because um, we've been cut off in many ways from our support systems, from hobbies, from a lot of things that we tend to do for our own mental wellness. So I like to bring this up as well, because again, in trying not to over pathologize um, some of the things that we're going through, um, again, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you're languishing, you shouldn't go see a counselor or talk to somebody. I think that is a great idea, um, but just kind of another perspective of some of the things that are out there that can kind of define what we've been going through during this exceptionally difficult time for us all. So why should we talk about mental health at all? Like, why are we having this? Why are we talking about what counseling is or anything? Um, and like I said, COVID really has brought mental health to light for a lot of people. Um, it's really shown people that mental health is something that we all have, and it's something that we can all struggle with, just as we can all struggle with physical health. Um, we have that spectrum of wellness. Um, and I think one of the things that people don't realize is that our mental health and our physical health are not actually two separate things. We often talk about them as if they're separate, but what goes on with us mentally impacts our body and vice versa. So I mentioned um, somebody who's dealing with depression might be eating or sleeping too much or not enough. And if we're not getting enough sleep, that's impacting our immune system. Um, if we're eating too much, that might be impacting our blood pressure or our cholesterol levels, depending on what that person is necessarily eating. Um, research has shown that about 60% of people that have had a heart attack will be diagnosed with depression after the fact. And it's not a case of this individual is now depressed because they're facing immortality. It's an issue of this heart attack has actually changed the way our brain functions. So, so these are two very intertwined things and things that we can't necessarily separate. So when we're talking about a pandemic that is impacting so many of us physically, um, we have to talk about the way that it's impacting us mentally as well. There's all, also so much misconception and stigma around mental health still. Um, you know, younger generations tend to be more comfortable talking about it, but that's not universal. And you know, mental health occurs across the entire um, lifetime, you know, so people in their 80s and 90s experience mental health and mental wellness and mental illness, um, just like um, young children do as well. And I think it's also important to talk about so that people understand that recovery is possible. Uh, mental health disorders are very treatable. There is a number of different treatments that we're going to talk about today. Um, and mental, most disorders are also episodic. So if you have a depressive episode, you might be feeling depressed, you might be experiencing those symptoms for a number of weeks, maybe even a number of months. But after that depressive episode ends, you might not have another episode for 
months or years, um, if ever again, if you ever have another episode again. So having a diagnosis of a major depressive disorder or an anxiety disorder does not mean you are going to be sad or fearful every day, all day for the rest of your life. And I think that's really important that people know about that and understand that this is something that is very treatable. So what are these treatment options that are out there? Obviously, I talked about counseling, therapy. Um, you know, they're kind of used interchangeably. So if you hear someone talking about a therapist or a counselor, all pretty much the same thing. But what really what we're looking for is we're looking for a licensed professional. So we look at our licensed clinical professional counselors, our licensed clin clinical social workers, uh, licensed psychologists licensed clinical marriage and family uh, therapists, uh, licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselors. There's um, licensed art therapists as well. So any of these individuals are able to, you know, work with insurance companies. Um, not every therapist does, but many do. Um, so, you know, going through your own insurance company or checking out the therapist's website in advance to know what insurances they take is important. But this isn't something that you're necessarily going to need to pay out of pocket for. Um, therapy is covered under insurance. It doesn't necessarily mean it covers a lot of therapy. Um, insurance companies still have a long way to go to really be um, treating mental health appropriately. But um, there are at least some sessions that uh, pretty much all insurance companies can give at this point. Uh, for somebody who's experiencing a mental health disorder. In addition to therapy, you know, which is talk therapy, cognitive behavioral things along those lines, um, there are different medications that are very effective for mental health uh, disorders. And they're prescribed by uh, psychiatrists, psychiatric nurse practitioners, um, psychiatric physician's assistants, I don't think I have that one on there, or even just your primary care physician. Psychiatrists are kind of hard to come by sometimes. Uh, psychiatric nurse practitioners are, I think, a little bit more common, but there are so many people that go into their primary care physicians and, you know, talk about their symptoms that they're experiencing. And that's where they get their first either mental health diagnosis or um, their first prescription for medication. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with going to a primary care physician to talk about your mental health. Uh, peer support is something else that's really gaining a lot of um, traction over the, the last couple of years. And peer support is all about um, people with lived experience. So the people who lead these groups are not necessarily licensed clinicians in any way, shape, or form, but they've gone through some training and they have been diagnosed with depression or anxiety or schizophrenia or whatever other disorder they um, may have, and they have been in treatment, they have achieved some sort of recovery. So they have that lived experience. It's kind of think of it like AA, um, Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous, but for mental health disorders. So it's people who've been there, um, but are not necessarily uh, a licensed clinician. Um, there are lots of coping skills out there that people can employ to help um, improve their mental health, improve their mental wellness. And social support networks are so important. It's one of the things that I talk about most. Um, you know, our friends, our family, uh, spiritual leaders, coworkers, whoever it is, there's no, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, your parents or your spouse. Um, it can be anybody who you feel like is your social support network. And making sure that we are keyed into those individuals um, and we are, you know, being there and being supportive of them, but also utilizing their support of us when we need it. So what do we expect from counseling? So you've decided, you know, maybe you went to your primary care, ther primary care doctor first, and they referred you to a therapist, and you're going for your first session. What, do you, what can you even expect when you go see a counselor? Your first session is gonna be something called your intake. 
And most therapists are going to do what's called a biopsychosocial assessment. Um, sometimes they're a little long, sometimes not so much. Sometimes they're very structured and there's specific questions that they ask you. Sometimes it's more just like a conversation and they get the information they need there. But really what they want, they want to know about your history. They want to know, um, you know, what symptoms you're experiencing. Have you ever experienced those symptoms before? Mental health has a genetic component. So is there anybody else in your family that's maybe experienced depression or anxiety or any other mental health disorder before? Are there any substances that you use and how frequently? Um, sometimes, again, depending on what's going on and why you're there, they might talk about you know, any legal history that you might've had, um, uh, sexual activity, all, all sorts of different things. Because what the intake session is, is really an opportunity for this therapist to get a good, a good picture of who you are. Um, you know, obviously they're not going to get all of the details. Um, you know, that's why we continue to, um, you know, see therapists for, you know, sometimes an extended period of time because there's so much more than we can really get on a biopsychosocial assessment. But by gathering some of these um, key pieces of data, this is how you and your therapist work to together to develop a treatment plan. You know, so what are the things that you want to work on? Um, and, you know, when they're coming up with different strategies that they can work with you on, you know, knowing some of your history, if you've worked with counselors before, if you've not, you know, they can, um, they can understand a little bit better, you know, what might work and what might not work so well for you. Because maybe there have been things that have worked or haven't worked for you in the past. Um, aside from the intake session, um, you know, when you start going to see your counselor regularly, you talk about the problem, whatever your presenting problem is. So whether it's stress at work, whether you have a diagnosis of depression, um, whether it's a relationship that's ending and you need some help getting through that, um, you talk about the problem, talk about what's going on. Um, therapy can be brief and spoke, focused on one specific issue. So again, it could be just my relationship is ending and I'm having a hard time with it. Um, but for an individual who maybe has a, a long history of trauma or there's been a number of things that have gone on, um, you know, that discussion can really go back a number of years and talk about a lot of different things that have contributed to your current mental state and where, where you are right now. It's important to note, you know, we talk about, you know, counseling and talk therapy, just talking about your problem is not going to fix it, right? Uh, we actually need to do something to help solve our problems or to help cope with our problems at the very least. So you're not going to go into a therapy session and sit there for 55 minutes and just talk about your problems. Um, you might do that a little bit at first, just to kind of, again, help the therapist get a better understanding of what's going on, develop some self-awareness about what's going on for yourself. Um, but really what you're going to do together is to develop strategies to cope or how to make changes. So therapy is action oriented. There are things that we need to do and things that we need to take away from, from counseling. And there's going to be homework and it's not necessarily. It might be reading a book, it might be doing an exercise, but it's really going to be to take these coping skills you're working on and put them into play in the real world, um, you know, so that if you are feeling angry or frustrated at work, you know, what's that coping skill we talked about in therapy the other day? Okay, let me try to use it. Did it work? Did it not work? And then you report back to your counselor at the next session and you talk about maybe why it worked or why it didn't work. And is this something you want to keep working with or do we want to try something different? Again, it's very action oriented in that way. Um, the counselor client relationship is actually one of the most important indicators of the therapy being effective. So it's really important that you, not that you have to be best friends with your counselor, but it's very important that you click with your counselor well that you feel like you have a rapport, that you feel like you can trust them and that they can trust you, um, that you have a mutual respect for each other. Um, because if you don't like your counselor, but you're just still going, 
you're not going to be doing what they're, you know, talking to you about, right? If they are coming up with goals or treatment plan options that you don't agree with, but you don't feel comfortable speaking up, is that going to be effective, right? So you have every right to, whether, you know, if you're in a larger practice to, you know, say, listen, I don't think this is working between me and this counselor. I'd like to see somebody different. Or if it's just an individual counselor who's alone in their practice, you know, leaving and saying, hey, can you give me a referral to somebody else? I don't feel like this relationship is working. And that can be hard doing that. But if that relationship is not there, if that rapport isn't there after a session or two, because again, of course, when you're going for an intake, you're just getting to know this person, right? Um, but if after a couple of sessions, that's really, it's not what it needs to be, that you don't feel comfortable with this person, or you don't like, you know, whether how they talk to you, or whatever the case may be, you need to go find a different counselor because otherwise, you know, you're, you're ending up wasting your time if you're not going to take away something from that experience. There are a lot of benefits of counseling. You know, I, I talk about doing this because there are so many good things about it. And the number one thing that I like is the fact that a counselor is a neutral party. Uh, they have no vested interest in your life, right? They're not, you know, your parents or your friends or your spouse who, you know, they want certain outcomes for you, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, hopefully they want you to be well, but you know, they might have very specific things that they think you should do or um, things that maybe you should aspire to or to be, and you might not agree with that. And the counselor, their job is to base your therapy outcomes on what you want. So if you're going because you're maybe struggling with some transitions from high school to college, and you're trying to figure out what you want to do, and maybe you and your family have a disagreement about what you want to do as far as a career path. Your therapist's job is to help you figure out how to do what you want. It's not their job to make you go down a certain path. It's not their job to force you to have a confrontation with your family if that's not what you want, right? Their job is to find out what you want and help you get there. Uh, their job is to build autonomy, self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is all about your belief that I can do something, right? Resilience, your ability to bounce back after we fail in certain situations. Uh, the counselor does not want you to be dependent on them. They don't want you to come to them for every little thing that goes on. They want you to be able to take what you're learning in your sessions and apply it to other areas of your life. Um, it, it's just so important to be able to get those skills and to feel confident that, you know, I can do what I want to do. I can do what I need to do. Doesn't mean it's not always going to be challenging, right? Um, but that's what the counselor is there for, to support you in making the decisions that you feel like you need to make, as long as those decisions are safe decisions. Um, you know, counselors may have to intervene in certain situations, but um, if you are making uh, safe choices, again, it doesn't matter whether the counselor agrees with your choices or not, as long as, you know, you are being safe in whatever you're doing, it's their job to help you get there. And it's also important to know that you don't have to be ill to go to counseling. There are many people that see therapists for a tune-up. You know, maybe they went for um, a depressive episode a year ago and, you know, maybe they're not depressed now, but, you know, they're kind of going through a tough time and they kind of want to get a little bit of extra support so they don't have another depressive episode. That's fine. If you're struggling with a transition in your life, that's another great reason to go to counseling, to work on some strategies to deal with transition. Um, again, I, I mentioned when relationships end, it doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna have a depressive disorder when your relationship ends, but going to counseling can help you um, kind of navigate what's, what happens after the ending of a relationship. So that's also important to remember. You know, We talked about not wanting to over pathologize when we talk about anxiety and depression. 
but you don't necessarily have to have a disorder to go to counseling. It's beneficial outside of that as well. So when you're looking for a provider, there are some things that you should you know, keep in mind. Again, I mentioned the relationship. Do I click with this counselor? Do we have any sort of rapport? Do I feel comfortable with them? Do I feel like I could, even if I can't open up and tell them everything in the first session, do I feel like I could maybe get to that point with this individual? Definitely one of the most important things to look for. Um, if you care, some people don't, um, uh, but thinking about the therapeutic modality that the counselor uses. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, this is one of the most popular, um, you know, between CBT and kind of an eclectic gathering of everything. Um, it works on, you know, your behaviors, it works on your thought patterns. Um, there's person-centered therapy, which is um, all about supporting you as an individual. Um, gestalt, psychodynamic, you're not going to find too many psychodynamic therapists. Um, existential therapists, eclectic, um, eye movement, um, desensitization and reprogramming, which is really good for certain things like trauma or ADHD. There's art therapy, equine therapy. There are so many different options out there. If you want to, you know, I always encourage people to do their research, find out a little bit about each therapeutic modality, um, you know, and when you're in your intake session or even before you make the appointment, when you're talking to a counselor on the phone trying to make that appointment, talk about, you know, like what, what kind of therapy do you use? Do you use C CBT? Do you use existential therapy? Um, you know, they'll be, they'll be thrilled you asked. <laughs> they love to talk about this. Um, and really just to kind of give you a little bit more information about what you're getting into um, and what you can expect your sessions to look like, because each of these types of modalities might look a little bit different when you're actually in the session. Obviously with art therapy, you're gonna be doing art. Um, whereas with CBT, you're not gonna be doing so much creative expression type things. Um, you can also look for group counseling. Um, groups are really wonderful. I love leading groups actually. Um, they are a less expensive option for both the insurance company and you individually, generally speaking. Um, so you can sometimes get some more sessions than you could with individual. Um, the downside is, you know, you're, you're splitting your time with, you know, it's not, you're not getting that one-on-one -on -one FaceTime with the counselor, but the benefit is you get to learn from other people's experiences as well. So you get to be in a room with, you know, six to eight other people um, and you might all be dealing with depression or you might all be dealing with anxiety or relationship breakup or trauma or whatever the case may be. So there's a lot we can learn from each other's experiences. And even if you're not getting the one-on-one -on -one work, if we're listening and we're paying attention to what's going on with everybody else, there are definitely some wonderful things we can take away from a group experience. So Again, I love groups, groups are great. Um, and there's also sometimes where what we need to look for is um, somebody who has a specialty in our presenting problem. Now, when we're talking about depression and anxiety, again, I mentioned those are two of the most common diagnoses that we see. So pretty much every therapist is going to be able to do work with you on depression or anxiety. But there are certain things, um, certain disorders that you really are going to want somebody who has a specialty. Eating disorders is a big one. Um, unfortunately, you know, many therapists aren't trained specifically on how to work with people with eating disorders. And if it's not approached correctly, can actually make the situation worse rather than better. Um, trauma, again, I mentioned that EMDR, which can be effective for trauma. There's also a lot of other biofeedback programs um, that can help with um, reprocessing and reprogramming the brain around trauma. Substance abuse, again, substance abuse and mental health are really more closely related um, than most people think. And the licensing boards are finally realizing that, which is good. Um, but there's still some specialty in substance abuse, um, you know, that the LCABCs um, understand that maybe some LCPCs might not have as much experience in. And again, marriage and family therapy, 
um, that's going to look really different than individual therapy. So finding um, an LCMFT, a licensed clinical marriage and family therapist, um, can be really important in helping work with some of those dynamics in that spousal relationship as well as the whole family relationship. So what are some of the things that you can do now? So whether you're still not sure if you wanna to go to therapy or talk to your primary care physician, or maybe you have a lot of expenses right now and you're like, that is just not in my, in my wheelhouse, you know, financially at this moment, that's fine. There are some things that we can do right now at this moment that can help manage, you know, stress, help manage, um, you know, mental health disorders that we might be experiencing. One, take a break, please. This has been a really tough year and a lot of us have been going nonstop and we've had no separation from work or school and home. You know, we're doing everything in the same space, whether we're taking meetings in our bed and then trying to sleep in our bed later in the day, or we have our kids running around and, you know, what we're trying to do stuff in an office. There is very little separation. So taking a purposeful break where you don't focus on any work, don't focus on any school, you know, spend just some family time. Or if, you know, you've been trapped with your family for 15 months, maybe you take a vacation on your own. It doesn't even need to be a vacation. Um, you know, spending a day at a community pool with a friend um, or by yourself, um, taking a walk or a hike by yourself, um, going to the library and reading or a coffee shop and, you know, bringing a book along with you and spending some time for you. And again, very purposefully doing just something you enjoy. Um, getting a change of scenery also helps too. Um, so if you've been in an office um, or sitting at the kitchen table, you know, working or, you know, doing your schoolwork, you know, maybe rearrange the furniture a little bit. Um, you know, put a new picture up, you know, move some, some plants around something, change up your scenery and make it a little bit more novel. Um, because when we are looking at the same thing all day, every day, um, you know, that can become really monotonous. And so that novelty of changing things up and changing our scenery, or again, as things are getting better, if you can go to a coffee shop, you can go to Starbucks and, you know, do some work there or go to the library, whatever the case may be. Um, that can really help our brain kind of kick back into gear um, in a helpful way. And again, enjoying the thing, giving yourself permission to enjoy things. Uh, not everything needs to be about accomplishing something. You don't need to come out of everything with a goal achieved or uh, with something to show for your time. Sometimes, sometimes the goal is just to not do anything, right? Um, just doing things because they feel good. Um, as long, again, as long as you're being safe, that's always a theme, uh, making sure you're being safe, but just doing things because it makes you smile or it makes you feel happy. Um, we cannot underestimate how important things like that really are to our mental wellness. So that's all we have for today on our What is Counseling presentation. I hope that you've learned a little bit about what you can expect if you go see a counselor and are now equipped to find somebody um, and do your research and pick a counselor that is going to be helpful and effective for you. Thanks so much for being here.